last week we talked about confidence in the spirit because the previous week we talked about well actually the previous week we saw David Barton and uh, that was pretty awesome but the pre week before that we talked about can you have confidence in the flesh confidence in the flesh can you have confidence in the flesh and I said yes you can have confidence in the flesh most people do even Christians have confidence in the flesh and Paul had confidence in the flesh and it got him knocked off of his horse and he went blind those were the results of having confidence in the flesh but then can you have confidence in the spirit yes and Paul had confidence in the spirit and the results of having confidence in the spirit was that he wrote most of the New Testament that we all read and we all study and we all understand is comes directly from the Holy Spirit so having confidence in the spirit is challenging for Christians to be on a, to be consistent and if anything we should be consistent and that's the way that we develop that depth of the intimacy in our relationship with God and that is the basis that's the foundation the theme that we've been talking about week after week after week now is that um, to develop the intimacy the depth of the intimacy of our relationship with God and that's what we need that's where everything else comes from and it, it's, it feels to me like I've kind of been harping on it and I think I have and it's good we're just gonna keep harping on it until until there's a, a word from God that he says you know what let's move on to something else but uh, right now we're going to be talking about confidence in the confidence in and from yeah. the spirit we ended up we, we were going through some verses last week and we and I said we would continue with Romans 8 4 and Romans 8 4 says that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the spirit now back in Romans 8 1 I believe it was it also said uh, who do not walk according to the flesh I, my research showed that the best manuscripts and most manuscripts really don't have that those words in that verse they do come into they do come into this verse here but that verse was it was uh, inferring that if you walked in the flesh then you couldn't you weren't you weren't receiving the Lord and that's it's just not true because the Lord loves everybody anyway that that's it's not a big controversy it's just I, I wanted to be clear because in this verse it makes sense and we're going to talk about it the righteous requirement of the law the, does that seem intimidating to, to anyone or like maybe you should just skip over it or you don't really quite understand it or is it just me it's just me oh okay well it simply means does it so so then since you all know what what does the righteousness the righteous requirement of the law what does it mean Believing faith. 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 Pretty close. It just it just means Jesus. He is the requirement, the righteous requirement of the law. Is Jesus. There's nothing else that can be the, the that can fulfill the requirement of the law except for Jesus, the Messiah coming and, and to, that He came to fulfill the law. And that's in this verse that's what it means is that Jesus he came to fulfill the law and notice that it's a singular it isn't requirements it's requirement it isn't 613 of those or even 10 of the commandments of those it's Jesus is the righteous requirement of the law when we're born again our spirits are 100% saved sanctified and righteous because our spirit is now the spirit of God the Godhead the Father the Son the Holy Ghost the old spirit is dead we talked a little bit about that last week dead 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 to death they're just I mean it's just dead we are not able to nor will we ever resurrect that that old spirit that old man it is non resurrectable we talked a little bit about we were due we take communion in remembrance of what Jesus did and we sin sometimes in remembrance of that old man we talked a little bit about that last week now our souls and our bodies however are not saved and, and sanctified and uh, justified and righteous when we're when we're born again 
it's our spirits that, that change. It's our spirits that die off and we get the new spirit, the new, we're new creation. It'll take some effort and some revelation from God to be renewed and transformed in our bodies and our souls. But it can happen, not, not 100% really until we see the Lord, but, but we can more and more be transformed into, and, and you know, Adam is, is a perfect example, and George, same thing. You know, they've, they've been walking with the Lord for a long, long time, and George, George made every effort he could to get to school, and he, he, he became a student at Karis Bible College. That's the kind of desire that pe people like, like, like them have, you know, they have that desire to do that. It isn't because they thought that going to Karis Bible College that, that it would make them get closer to God or that God would do something for them. It's that they wanted to know Him more and they, they want to get that new transformation and that, that renewal of their minds. But it'll take, it'll take some effort. It, it does take some effort. I'm going to take a little rabbit trail. Um, God gave the law to Moses and Moses gave the law to the Israelites. Actually, the law itself is twice removed from the people because in the Bible it says that God gave it to the angels and the angels gave it to Moses and the Moses gave it to the people. Twice removed because, well, and let me read this. So, so, I mean, it does say that in the Bible. I checked it out. It's true. It's right here. I got it. It's Acts 7.53. The uh, who have received the law by the direction of angels and have not kept it. Now, this is something that um, I think occurred, or I, 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 remember, I remember hearing about it or thinking about it when I was in Bible college a few years ago. But I'm curious if, if this is new information for people. Is, is everybody, this is the way I get to know you. Is this new information to anybody? Are you willing to raise your hand if it is? Okay. Okay, thank you so much. It really helps. That who have received the law by the direction of angels and have not kept it. Now Galatians 3.19 says, What purpose then does the law serve? It was added because of transgression till the seed should come to whom the righteous um, requirement. The seed should come to whom the promise was made and it was appointed through angels by the hand of a mediator. Acts 7.38 This is he who was in the congregation in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him on Mount Sinai and with our fathers, the one who received the living oracles to give to us. So, everything that God created, as you recall in Genesis, was perfect. He said, this is good. Everything was good and everything was perfect. And Adam and Eve had a short time, I don't know how long, but a while they were just like living in this paradise and everything was perfect. The law was perfect for what it was intended for, but it could make nothing perfect, right? We all kind of, we all talked about that a lot over the last couple of weeks. Since it never made man righteous, it had to be removed from God between the people and man. It had, it, it had to somehow be put in a couple of mediators, in other words, the angels and then Moses and then the people. Because Jesus, the righteousness of God, the righteousness, that, the righteousness of the law, Jesus, comes directly from the Father to the people. Because he is perfect and he, and, and, and he had, he's, he's, he's the better hope. He's the better hope that was given to us by the Father. We're going to get back to our original theme, though, about a deeper um, intimacy with God. If we're to deepen our relationship with Him, we need to know Him more, right? Yeah. I mean, that just that's even with people. Dixie and I know each other pretty well, and our relationship is deeper and deeper than it's ever been. You know, it's been 42 years, and... It's, it's the best, this is the best part of our life, entire, uh, my life anyway, I'll let her speak for herself, but this is the best part of my marriage um, and my life right now. And it's because I know her more, because I know God more. To know Him more, we need to hear Him and not only talk to Him, just talk to Him, but hear Him, that let Him talk back to us, to, to understand his character and his ways 
it's just really important. So we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna look at that a little bit. But the reason I bring that up is because again, I'm, I went for many many years claiming to be a Christian and not being born again because th that's kind of the way that's just the way it was with me. And then after I was born again, it was still time that I went through that these things were happening where I was just not really searching God. I was I was searching. I've always been a seeker. I've always wanted to know about spiritual things, and I went all kinds of different directions trying to find it. But, but the the depth of the intimacy of my relationship with God didn't didn't begin until years after I got born again. But even though that God is constantly and continually speaking to us, and He's very involved in all of the details of our lives. Um, he is very infinitely patient. He, he's not going to push himself on us. He didn't push himself on me, even though I was seeking spirituality all those years. He did not push himself on me. Because he knows that the greatest thing, the greatest gift that he's ever given us is freedom. In other words, our free will. Without that freedom or our free will, uh, we would not have the power to love. Either, either, or either love ourselves or anybody else or even love God without free will. We would just be walking around like robots. When people start talking about the sovereignty of God and that everything is God's will and that everything that happens is in His will, it's because He wills it that way, it's impossible. Not only does it not make any sense and is one of the worst doctrines in the body of Christ that's just so devastating and so, destroys so many lives, it's not even possible. If that was true, we'd all just be walking around just doing whatever God tells us to do. If he says, pick this up, I pick this up. If he says, me kill you, I kill you. You know, that's what the Muslims think. That's what happened at 9-11. They believe that God told them to do that, so they did it. So obviously, it is impossible for that to happen. Um, but God respects our freedom. He, he does. He respects our freedom. Remember that that we talked about a few weeks ago, Jesus is the law of liberty. The law of liberty is Jesus. And if we want to habitually and excessively uh, operate only within our own reason, or within our own intellect, or with our own ideas, our own vision, if we want to do that, he's, gonna, he's just going to, he's not going to interfere. He's not going to get in the way of what we want to do. But he's still speaking to us during that whole time. There's a couple of things. We may not be able to hear him because we are so busy doing what we want to do. Um, or we'll have a tendency to reject what he's saying. If we do hear him. No, uh, that can't be God. I think I'll just go do this. No, this, this seems right. I'm going to do this. So, it's, so, so we will have the tendency to reject him because we want something more. And not by God we're going to get it. There's a couple of reasons for this. Number one, I think, one, one of, I don't know if it's number one, but it's one of them, is that he speaks the language of faith. We, we've talked about that too. And if we are completely working with on our own reason and within our own thoughts and intellect and vision and desires, um, there is little or no faith, and what faith there is, is human faith, not supernatural faith. And so we are not going to be able to interpret what he says to us, because his language is the language of faith, supernatural faith. You know, human faith is, is what relies on what we can see, taste, hear, smell, and feel. Um, in, in Ephesians 2.8, it says here, he get, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that, not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. Here's the difference. If I ask you to sit in a chair, and um, you would have faith that the chair would probably, especially if it was one of these, you'd have faith that the chair would probably hold you up, right? Um, but if I ask you to sit in a chair you couldn't see, Probably not, you're not going to do it, because you know what the end results are going to be, probably. Or if I ask you to sit in a chair that only had three legs, when you glance over to look at it, and you go, whoa, wait, wait, I'm not going to sit in that. So God's 
gift of faith is supernatural. And that means that we need to believe in that chair that we can't see. God is a spirit, and we need to worship him in spirit and in truth. We need to, and so we do, right? I mean, we all, I'm, I'm assuming that everybody here, I mean, I don't know everybody, we've got some new people, but I'm assuming that probably everybody here believes in God, and they've never seen him, more than likely. Never seen God. And probably everybody here believes in angels, or the devil. Uh, never seen any of those entities, but, the, but believe in them. And that's the kind of, that's the kind of faith that we have to put in God's grace. By grace, for by grace you have been saved through faith. We can't see God's grace, but we have to put, and it's, for some reason it's spiritually, it's just a little easier to do that than to believe for our healing sometimes. It's easier to believe in something that we can't see sometimes. But it, it's the same belief, if we're gonna, However we believe is, is, is really what's going to happen. I've mentioned this before in the last couple of weeks that I believe that God has given grace to every human being. There's a common grace that, that he gives to all of his children. He loves everyone. He loved us when we were still sinners, remember? Um, in Titus 2.11 he says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. And my... What I've come up with here is that grace is the closest thing to us not having a free will. We can't ever get there, but it's the closest thing. Grace is the closest thing to us not having a free will. It's the closest thing to sovereignty, which can never happen. But think about it. By, by that I mean that if we were to believe that everything happens is the will of God, um, which would mean that... Uh, we would not have a will, free or otherwise, then we'd all just, like I said, be walking around like robots. But not walking in the flesh and not walking in the spirit, walking around like robots. There's no flesh, there's no spirit, just walking around like robots. There's no desires because it's his will that we eat. <laughs> it's his will that we drink a glass of water. So there's no flesh. There's no flesh in that, in that realm. But since he has given grace, which undeserved love is one definition, to everyone, every man, mankind has only one choice to make to get to the point of complete rest and being born again or born, born from above. In our old man, die and we still have free will, only one choice, and that is to believe in that grace. Lou Ray said that, you know, the, the, the scripture that she quoted and was talking about, you know, t teaching other people and that we're out there, we're, we're called to do that. That's the only thing we need to teach them is that God has given everyone grace. So everyone in the pride parade had God's grace. And the only thing that we need to teach them is that they need to believe in that grace. Every, every rich billionaire, millionaire that, that has not been born again has God's grace. Our calling is to live our lives in a way that when we're around that, well, I don't know how many times you're around a billionaire or a millionaire, but when you are, that he will see or she will see this peace, this, I see it on all of you when I have meetings with you or talk with you or whatever. I just see this peace, that there's a Christian peace. I guess I'll call it that. If you don't have it, it's, 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 it doesn't, it doesn't really, it's not powerful. I call that common grace. That's what I call it. I think other people have called it that too. That's common grace that just God has for everyone that he created. The, the grace that we receive after we're born again uh, or born from above um, is much more and when we receive that grace it all becomes less of a mystery am I right doesn't it all become less of a mystery doesn't it yeah, yeah. Um, doesn't it not seem foolish anymore the foolishness deteriorates it goes it just kind of almost goes away 
until you more renew your mind and then you realize that foolishness is now what now everyone else that's out there that has not been born again still has the foolishness and it seems foolish to them what we it's now less of a mystery it's not foolishness anymore first corinthians 1 18 says that um, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. There's people that, and you know, probably some people that you know, that think that you believing in the cross is foolish. What do you mean he rose from the dead? What do you mean? You know, it's foolish. But to us, it is the power of God. Grace is now an active expression of God's love in our lives as a, as a born-again believer. It's an active expression of God's love in our life, grace. And, and really, all it takes is to say it out loud, right, and believe it in your heart. That's all, that's all it really takes. And now that empowers us to choose rightly in, in, what, in, in our past spiritual existence would seem like choiceless situations we can choose correctly because we said that we believe in Jesus Christ, that he raised from the dead and he forgave our sins. And now we have this resource to choose correctly under, in situations where previously we would have said, There's, what choice do I have? There's no choice. And now we have a choice because we have the Spirit of God in us. This intimate, conne this intimate connection of our will with God's will and our spirit with God's spirit is a miracle. The miracle of God in us and us in God. God's presence perfecting our personal transformation. These are all things that happen when we're born again. Grace now becomes freedom that conforms us from within if we choose to. Grace conforms us from within. Legalism, or the law of linearity, as I've talked about before, is bondage that constrains us from the outside. So I've talked about the law of linearity is just is just the residual of the of the old Mosaic law of the old of the old covenant. It's a law that we live in. This is where we live. This is how we live in this law of linearity. That we need to figure out what to do in order to get God's blessing as part of it. But also there's consequences for everything we do against the law in our country, in our city, in our house sometimes. <laughs> you know, legalism in the Old Testament was a covenant, right? Uh, it came from God. And it was set before the Israelites to help them behave in a way to obtain that relationship with God. Because before that, there was no law. There was, they could just do whatever they wanted to do, and they would suffer the consequences. You know, there definitely was consequences. And there was a conscience. I mean, they knew things were wrong, but they didn't, they didn't have to do anything because there was no transgression. There's no transgression, so it didn't matter what they did. If they did it, they did it, and it was like no big deal. Exodus um, 9, five says, Now therefore... If you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all of the earth is mine. God gave that covenant. Legalism gave them a chance to prove that they wanted God as their king. I thought about that today when we were singing. They wanted God as their king. It gave legalism... The law gave them an, uh, an opportunity to prove that they really wanted God as their king. You know, now that they had, now that God had freed them from bondage of, of Egypt, of slavery in Egypt. Exodus 20, 20 says, And Moses said to the people, Do not fear, for God has come to test you, and that his fear may be before you, so that you may not sin. This was a two-sided covenant, by the way. Because in the next couple of verses, Exodus 19.8, it says, Then all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. 
They completely bought into this agreement. They completely bought into this covenant. So God killing all those people and causing all those things that we just did not understand, you know, as new believers, it was a two-way street. They agreed to the deal. They, you know, Deuteronomy just laid it all out. It laid out what was going to happen if they disobeyed. And they said, we agree. And then again, in 24.3 in, uh, in Exodus, it said, So Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the judgments. All the judgments. And all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words which the Lord has said, we will do. So they were buying into it. So th this is the only way that God could deal with the people in the Old Testament. And that brought something else to my mind one day, a couple, a couple of weeks ago. Is that, as, I, as I, I've been going through the Old Testament again recently, and, and as I do, I find out that God hardly ever, if probably not to the people in general, never talked about spiritual things. It was always about the flesh. That sounds kind of odd. I don't know, I don't know maybe not. But he, when he judged people, he judged them by the flesh because that's what they had, the flesh. They, don't have, they didn't have the spirit. And when he rewarded people, what did he reward them with? Milk and honey and grapes this big and just all of these vineyards that they didn't have to plant and you know all this food and just it was all physical flesh things because Jesus had not come yet so there's no spiritual there was nothing spiritual that they that they that he could deal with them on that basis now he dealt with the prophets and he dealt with Abraham and he dealt with Moses and he de of these people that had the holy spirit at least uh, recognize the Holy Spirit, recognize the Spirit of God, but they did it through through uh, faith. Abraham did it through faith. So, anyway, that was kind of another little sidetrack. But anyway, that's enough about legalism right now. I just wanted I, I want to get back to um, talk about grace and and hearing God. Um, I'd like to mention though that uh, the intimacy with God is re it's required to live a fulfilled and successful Christian life. Does that scare anybody? No? No? It is required to live a fulfilled and successful Christian life to deepen your relationship with God. Because when we reach or restore that intimacy in our relationship with God, we become open to deeper and more intimate relationships with the people around us. I can testify to that. It's, it's so true. Now I'm talking to God and I'm talking to Him just pretty much like I'm talking to you right now. And I'm understanding more and more that that's good, that that's really, really good to be able to feel that free to be able to do that. Amen. Now, I probably would need Dixie to testify to this, but... Um, I know that my relationship with Dixie has gone to another level since this has happened with me. And that's what I'm saying here is that when we reach or restore that deep intimacy with God, we become open to a deeper and more intimate relationships with people around us. Because of what I said just a few minutes ago, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit is in you, it's coming out, you're happy, and you just, it just is, it, it, now your relationships with people around you change. And, and here's another thing that happens, and this is really good, this is really important, and I, is that, remember, I don't know how many here remember when I talked about insecurities a couple of weeks ago. We talked about, you know, having insecurities and not, um, and not fessing up to them not acknowledging our own but always knowing that well they got insecurities and and yeah and it's real easy to see everybody else's insecurities but when we start looking at our own even though that most of the time we see the insecurities in other people that we have because we recognize them so much but you know we don't re we don't acknowledge that we have them so they just sit there 
and we just continue to believe that we are the person that has these insecurities. And then we associate with other people that accept us with those insecurities. They don't try to help us through those insecurities. They just accept us that way. And pretty soon we see ourselves as this person that has insecurities. We don't see ourselves as God sees us. But the insecurities are there. But when the restor restoration of a deeper intimate relationship with God happens, those insecurities can immediately be gone. It doesn't take a meeting with Dr. Phil right. to get rid of those insecurities. Amen? Amen. It takes a deeper, a more depth in the intimacy of the relationship with God, and they will go away. It will, they'll help us with, um, with our, our sense of, of security in who we are in Christ. They'll help us with a sense of significance in who we are in Christ. When we know that, when we actually get to know it, the significance and the, and the security, and the, not the insecurity, the security, in other words, that kind of security. The secure who you are, the significance, because those are all founded in who we are in Christ and who he is in us. And thanks to our choice to... to um, thanks to our choice to receive Jesus as our personal Savior, we now have the Holy Spirit as a resource so that we can become more aware of God's presence and less aware of His absence. Don't we say, where are you, God, sometimes? Where are you? What's going on? How come I'm in this mess? Da, 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 da. What am I doing wrong? And that was the whole thing. You know, now, when we, as we have that deeper relationship with God, we can focus on His purpose and His plan for our life instead of the hard life that we have and help me get out of it. Get it? Our focus changes and we're focused on Jesus. And now, the cancer is not our primary passion. The cancer is not our primary focus. We are now focused on Jesus. And that cancer can go away. But, I mean, I'm, I'm guessing that that's a primary way of getting rid of cancer Amen. or anything else. And the other thing is, that if, we're not in an, if we're not in an intimate relationship with God, it isn't because we haven't lived as we should or um, because if that were the case, now listen, to the, get this. If that were the case, if we, if, if we are not in an intimate relationship with God because we haven't lived right, if, in other words, if, if, if failure to live up to the principles and uh, the standards that are in the Bible, for instance, or any other principles and standards, if failure to live up to those principles is what keeps us from having a deep relationship with God, there would be no hope. Does any, does everybody, does, bless you. God bless you. <laughs> does that make sense? So if, if we start thinking about what am I doing wrong and, and, you know, I don't have a deep relationship with God and it's probably because I didn't do something. If that was true, think about it. If that was true, we would have no hope at all because we will never be able to do anything to receive God's love. Ever. It's a hopeless, it's a, that, that is hopeless. That's hopelessness right there. As long as we're trying to live from our own reason and intellect, visions and ideas, um, we'll never measure up. Never measure up. Not for a moment do we measure up. So it's pretty hopeless. So don't take what I'm saying, though, as uh, condemnation. Please, don't. It's so, it can be so easy for someone to do that. I'm glad nobody left while I was talking because I wanted to get this in. I am saying that all of the peace that the world gives is temporary, and so the tranquility and the joy that comes from good health, good family relationships, good friends, a good vocation, enough money, all of those, all of those, the peace that comes from that, and peace does come, right, from those kind of things, to the believer and to the non-believer. But none of them, none of them survive death. You die, it's all over.
But the peace that Jesus gives you, it goes on. And you have it while you're living. And if, you're, and if our focus is on our relationship with God, then we can have all of those things. Because we're not looking for those things. We're not asking for those things. We're focused on God. We're focused on glory and worship and praise and His holy and mighty name. And those things will come along. And we can enjoy them along with the, the, the relationship with God. Uh, Jesus said in John 14, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. That's the beauty of, of God's plan to give us a, a peace that only depends on one blessing. And he guarantees every single person who makes that choice by faith to receive his salvation from the law. Because otherwise you have to attempt to, to get saved through the law. And that's, that's impossible. The guarantee, this guarantee that I just mentioned that um, he guarantees every person who makes the choice by faith to receive his salvation from the law. Um, from the law of having to attempt to be served, saved by the law that cannot save no matter how hard we try. That guarantee, there's one author who, who gives a really good um, description of that. It says, the opportunity to draw near to him, that's the guarantee. He guarantees you the opportunity to draw near to him. To put every egg in the basket of his presence. To put every egg in the basket of his presence with us, even when his absence is all we feel. To depend on him to be doing a good work in us, even when everything else seems so bad. He still guarantees us that we can draw near to him even under those circumstances. Because I like the taste of ice cream. We talked about my taste in ice cream a couple of weeks ago too. But I like the taste of, of different, certain kinds of ice cream. And what I figured out is that liking encourages me to have another spoonful. It's the liking. It's the liking of that taste that has another spoonful. My stomach really doesn't care for it that much. You know, especially as it, as it you know, gets to the point of, you know, excess um, but the taste the taste is what makes it makes me want to have another spoonful and what I want is for us to have that same taste for God that same taste so that we'll always want another spoonful always want another serving and if I'm focused on my cancer my cancer if I'm focused on the disease in my body, if I'm focused on the lack of funds in my account, I am not going to look for another spoonful of God because I'm not focused on that. The taste isn't there. The taste is still, the, actually the taste is really on that. Anyway, God wants more than anything else to love us. That's his entire deal because he is love. The best way that we can make it possible for him to love us is just for us to allow him to love us. Just, just allow that. Draw near to him in any way that we can. Um, and here's the thing is we don't really need to do anything to do that. Just keep him in front of our life. Moment to moment. Day by day. Hour by hour. Whether, whether we're in an accident or um, if we get a big bonus or a raise from work. Um, if our kids finish school with uh, sparkling grades and get a degree that you know that they wanted, um, if one of them dies suddenly, if we get a bad report from the doctor, we are no longer under the law. The law has no jurisdiction over those things. We focus on Jesus. Because we've received the gift of grace through faith. We've received the gift of grace through faith so that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us. Right? Yes. Amen. If you're born again, this is true for you. If you're not, it's not true. If you're not born again or you're not sure, 
then come up and see us after the service whatever just get in touch we'll help you through that if you are baptized in the Holy Spirit it is also true that he has not only forgiven you but has given you the power through that same faith in and of Jesus Christ to become sons and daughters and God strengthens us strengthens us with power and Ephesians 3 16 through 19 says I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being verse 17 this is out of the NIV so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith and I pray that you being rooted and established in love verse 18 may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide, how long, how high, how deep. Is that highlighted, bolded, and underlined? Okay, good. How deep. That's the fourth dimension in these three, this three-dimensional world. How deep is the love of Christ? And number 19, verse 19, And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. It is possible to be in his presence under all circumstances I mentioned. All of those things that I said. It's possible. If you're going through any of these circumstances now, you may not feel like it can happen. You may not feel like you can, you can, this can actually go on in your life, that you can focus on God, that you can have that relationship. But I know there are people in this church that have gone through those things and worse. And they're here. And they made it. And that's one of the reasons that we have the testimonies. And so that we can get to know each other. And we can know what's going on in the body of Christ here. This is, this is the body of Christ. And if something is hurting in the body of Christ, then the rest of us, like our body, goes and fixes something. If I get a cut here, my body goes to work and fixes it. God made it that way. And the body of Christ is the same way. So that we can all help each other get a deeper Re intimate relationship with God. Father God, thank you so much for this beautiful, wonderful congregation. And we just thank you that you speak through us, through each other. And Father, we just, uh, we ask that, um, that you, you, you help us with your spirit to receive without any focus on our circumstances. To receive because we focus on you to help us to learn and to move in that direction to get a deeper and more intimate relationship with you. And let everything else just, just float on. It's worth it. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Amen.